Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming um, to our copyright event today. We, we are celebrating World IP Day. This year, we are joining the World Intellectual Property Organization by looking into the world of sports and copyright. There are countries all over the world celebrating this event. I believe there are over 300 events being held about it this year. So while many of you probably know about trademarks and team names or patents and equipment that helps people not injure themselves on the field, you might not be as familiar with how copyright interacts with, um, with the world of sports. So we're going to talk about that throughout this hour. And we have some very amazing speakers who are going to tell us a little bit about each part. And copyright really permeates the world of sports, even if you might not know it. It's everything from the songs that accompany the games to the merchandise that follows and the way that we make access to those games more accessible when you're sitting at home watching them, them on your TV. Sports and copyright also share the ability to inspire creation. There is an expressive role in sports where you have to be creative to do all sorts of things to figure out your next play. And copyright is also obviously about expression. And sports have inspired numerous copyrighted works. We're going to go over that a little bit throughout this, um, this event. And as Yogi Berra says, the future ain't what it used to be. And that is the same in sports because the world of sports has moved along into the realm of esports and online gaming. So there's a whole brave new world there that we're exploring now. So this year, we are going to have our three very great speakers talk about it. They're going to be talking about some broadcasting issues, merchandising issues, esports, and a lot more. And to help get us started, we are going to have Whitney Lewandowski, who is an attorney in our Office of Public Information and Education. And she's going to kick off our tour with showing you a little bit about the history of the relationship between sports and copyright. Whitney? I think I hear her. Thank you, Katie. Um, so Katie has set the scene for us, uh, sort of the things that we're going to be discussing today. Um, I would also like us to just start, we uh, heard from some uh, legislators and they wanted to send uh, their words of like appreciation and enthusiasm for World IP Day. Hi, I'm Tom Tillis, Senator from the great state of North Carolina and Chairman of the Intellectual Property Subcommittee. Thank you to the Copyright Office for hosting today's event and for all of the hard work you do to promote America's innovation economy. I also want to congratulate our new Register of Copyrights, Karen Temple, on her appointment. It's well deserved and long overdue. This year for World IP Day, we're examining the role that intellectual property plays in promoting sports. From design patents to illegal streaming and copyright content, the IP system plays a vital role in allowing American sports to be profitable. There are a number of sports IP issues that need to be addressed by Congress. For example, we must assess whether criminal penalties for illegal streaming of copyrighted materials are tough enough to deter bad actors. We also have to ask whether customs and border protection have the tools they need and the legal authorities to seize trademarks and products that infringe American patents. That's why Senator Coons and I are holding a hearing on the vital role that IP plays in sports on April the 30th. We'll cover these issues and we'll chart a path forward on how Congress can better promote sports and improve intellectual property protections. Throughout the process, I welcome your input and your guidance as we work on this important issue. So please be sure to contact my office at tillis.senate.gov. Thank you for your hard work. This is Congressman Hank Johnson, Georgia's 4th Congressional District, wishing everyone a happy World IP Day. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Judy Chu from California's 27th District. And as chair of the Creative Rights Caucus in the House, let me wish you a happy World IP Day. Creative works like movies, music, and books are some of America's greatest exports. And I'm so proud that many of these creative industries are based right in Southern California, creating jobs for thousands of artists, craftspeople, and specialists. 
Across our country, the creative industries have contributed over $1.2 trillion to our GDP. That's nearly 7% of the entire economy. That's why in Congress, I work to promote policies that protect IP against piracy and theft. We're also passing laws like the Music Modernization Act, which finally updated the Copyright Act to modernize music licensing and help more creators earn a living. But I know there's more work to be done to modernize the Copyright Office so it can meet the demands of the growing creative industries. And I'm committed to push Congress to do just that. So thank you for all that you do to help produce and protect works that shape our society. I'm proud to support your efforts and I'm proud to stand up for our copyright industries this World IP Day and every day. Hello, I am Karen Temple, the Register of Copyrights and Director of the United States Copyright Office. It is my pleasure to celebrate World IP Day with you. This year, in conjunction with the World Intellectual Property Organization's theme of sports and intellectual property, we are exploring how the copyright system supports athletics and sports, which are enjoyed by millions of people around the world. Happy World IP Day, and thank you to all of those who bring us so much from the world of sports and athletics. Go Team Copyright! a little bit about uh, the importance of copyright and especially uh, World IP Day and sort of the, the ways that we're thinking about um, copyright and, and its future. Um, and with the three types of federal intellectual property protection, uh, patent, trademark, copyright, um, they might have different legal standards, duration, scope of protection. But as Katie set up for us in our, her introduction, um, all sorts of intellectual property bear direct roles in supporting through the pursuit and enjoyment of sports. And Katie also highlighted that there are some easier ways that we think about the relationship between intellectual property and sports, right? Uh, there's the advances in helmet technology and the patents that might come with them. There's the trademarks that are associated when you are buying a jersey for your favorite team. Um, and with the copyright, with copyright, we, the relationship can sometimes be a little more surprising. And so as Katie previewed for us, um, we're going to be exploring where some of those surprising areas are. Because sure, we've all seen the copyright notice at the end of a sports broadcast in those quickly spoken words. Uh, you know, this telecast brought to you by your favorite sports association and is protected by copyright. We're going to hear more about what that disclaimer means and how it came to be. We're also going to explore where else copyright pops up in amateur and professional sports and how does copyright come into play when considering the future of sports. So copyright has supported sports and fans throughout American history. Uh, much of the music that accompanies games and other sporting events is highly creative and very memorable. And they help, the music helps to build our memories of the sporting events that we attend, right? Uh, so here we have an example of an early copyright deposit. This is James Goodman and C.F. Escher's registered baseball polka, which was registered in 1867. At the time, baseball songs were a popular form uh, of expressing fandom in the emerging baseball uh, sport, and you had sheet music that was distributed for playing on the piano. Many of the fight songs that you heard coming into the auditorium today in the Coolidge uh, were protected by copyright. Um, for they were first published in the early 20th century, and many of them are still protected by copyright today. Music is just one way that copyright intersects with sports. The teams that we love, and sometimes love to hate, often have copyright protected works themselves. For example, have you ever noticed that some logos, such as the Minnesota Vikings or the Oregon State Beavers, um, their logos are pretty creative, right? Uh, when they are creative, they have that minimum degree of creativity, they're gonna have copyright protection. And many of us may have seen these cheerleader outfits, right? Um, we know from copyright law that the useful utilitarian parts of clothing are not going to be protected by copyright. But the creative designs that are imagined separately from the uh, article of clothing can be protected by copyright. And even a couple years ago, the Supreme Court weighed in 
on this issue, uh, bringing cheerleader uniforms to the highest court in the land and uh, to the attention of copyright lawyers and people who are interested everywhere. Um, giving, it gives a whole new meaning to a full court press. I'm sorry about that joke. <laughs> Thank you. So of course, photography, right? So photography is key to sports enjoyment. Uh, photography captures emotional moments and tells entire stories in one frame. When you think about your favorite sporting event, say the World Cup or the NASCAR Sprint Cup, uh, and then you think about your favorite sports highlights, you feel a wave of feeling, right? You feel the connection, you feel the emotion, maybe you even feel the heartbreak of that sports moment that you're imagining. And when you think about it, how much of that memory is also specifically tied to a single image? Sports photography helps to establish the collective memory of sports. We draw from sports photography again and again. It's what binds us together. And it's not just the sensation of remembering the big win or the astounding feat. It's also about the creativity of the individual who is able to capture just the right moment that helps us to remember our sports highlights. And what about reporters? So the reporters, sports reporters, they document thrilling games and they share sports moments with fans who were not able to be, able to be there. Many sports writers have their own signature style, and they write about the sports that they love with flair and excitement. And here we have an example from Grantland Rice, alumnus football, uh, an enduring quote, for when the one great scorer comes to mark against your name, he writes not that you won or lost, but how you played the game. Now, not everything that you see on the screen or on the field uh, will be protected by copyright. So copyright recognizes social dances, they're not protected. And so we find that a lot of end zone games, in particular, the Copyright Office found there was an ode to the end zone dance, uh, was not protected by copyright. And it's important to note that how we've watched sports has evolved and engaged with copyright over time. Um, you no longer have to be in the stands. You don't have to be present to enjoy the game. You can be at home, you can be at a bar, you can be at a restaurant, you can be anywhere in public with friends and family. So with the advent of televised sports, that was the game changer, right? That's our beginning. And with that, we're able to provide access to an ever-increasing audience. And this is for sports of all types, right? And copyright law is intertwined with the broadcasting of these events. Copyright law and broadcasting has helped increase awareness of sports and games throughout the world. Our first speaker is Bob Garrett, who is senior counsel at Arnold and Porter. He will be exploring the relationship between sports and copyright and broadcasting. Bob practices uh, copyright and telecommunications law, specifically focusing on the intersection with sports, media, entertainment industries, and new technology. He represents and advises major sports leagues and has represented these clients in front of the Supreme Court, federal agencies, Congress, and the World Intellectual Property Organization. He's received numerous accolades over the years, but within the last year alone, he's been recognized as a leader in copyright law in Chambers USA, the Legal 500 US, and the Legal 500 Hall of Fame. So Bob will share with us the development of sports broadcasting, um, which is a copyright moment we've all experienced. And with, with copyright, what we're experiencing is uh, the, the right of public uh, performance. So an author who fixes the sports program in a video has the right to publicly perform that video, including by transmission. So I'll let Bob get into it. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Whitney. Good afternoon. The next month, will be the 80th anniversary of the first telecast of a sporting event on tel uh, 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 here in the United States. It was May 17, 1939, that an experimental NBC TV station licensed to uh, New York City uh, televised a game involving the Princeton and Columbia baseball teams. And for those who are interested, Princeton actually won that game uh, two to one. 
Uh, it wasn't viewed by very many people. About 400 households in the city of um, uh, New York actually had access uh, to, the, uh, to the telecast. Uh, perhaps more significantly, the production quality was not uh, terribly good. There was a single uh, camera uh, mounted on a 10-foot uh, platform um, between first and uh, third base. I tried to capture the action, did do a very good job of it. In fact, Variety, uh, a couple of days later, wrote an article just uh, uh, panning the, the, entire, uh, uh, the entire telecast. Uh, Bill Stern, who did the uh, announcing for the game that day, said he prayed for all of the batters to strike out because he knew that was the one thing that the camera could actually record. I think even less clear than the um, 1939 telecast itself was the future of sports on television. Uh, Oren Dunlap, uh, who uh, wrote for the New York Times, uh, a sports column uh, in th those years, uh, said that uh, baseball would probably never make it uh, on uh, television uh, because uh, fans would clearly prefer to be in the stands rather than at home uh, watching uh, uh, TV. Uh, he said that uh, sports from a sofa was much too safe because there's no ducking the foul ball. <clears throat> Many of the individuals involved in sports at the time uh, also had a very glum uh, prediction for the uh, future of uh, television and sports. Uh, and that is because they were concerned uh, about the ability of television uh, to depress gate receipts. That why would people come to the games if they could see them on, on, on TV? Now, if we fast forward 80 years, you know, we, we see that some of those early uh, uh, predictions were, were not very uh, accurate. I mean, today, uh, more than uh, $20 billion is spent every year uh, in order to acquire the rights to televise uh, base, baseball and other sports uh, uh, events on television. So sports from a sofa has become a very, very uh, profitable uh, uh, business. Uh, in fact, in 2019 alone, there will be over 5,000 telecasts of Major League Baseball games that uh, uh, individuals throughout the country will have access. Most people can receive uh, just about all of those games, assuming they're willing to, uh, to pay for them. Uh, the... Um, uh, each of those, uh, those telecasts will uh, also contain an announcement that something similar to this. This copyrighted telecast is presented by the authority of the Office of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form, and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. It's actually much more intimidating in this room than when you see it on TV, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, so did you ever wonder what type of conduct um, would run afoul of this warning or, or what would happen uh, if you didn't get the commissioner's consent? Well, the cartoonist uh, Steve Moore gave his take on, on, on this issue about 30 years ago. Uh, for those who can't uh, make out all of the, um, uh, of, of the, uh, the cartoon, uh, you, you have a couple of law enforcement officers who have just broken into some fan's apartment and shot him because he was recording a telecast. <clears throat> when one of them picks up a piece of paper, and looks at it and says, whoa, bummer. It uh, turns out this guy really did have the express written consent of the commissioner of baseball. <laughs> so two comments uh, on, the, uh, on the cartoon. Uh, one is that to the best of my knowledge, the commissioner of baseball has never authorized the shooting of any fan for not complying with the copyright uh, warning. And the second uh, is that uh, uh, baseball uh, was actually one copyright owner who was, uh, was not, um, uh, did not object uh, to the off-air recording uh, by fans of uh, telecasts of the game. In fact, the Supreme Court uh, in, in the Sony decision uh, specifically relied upon testimony from uh, the commissioner of baseball's office as well as other league offices that they had no objection. So what type of conduct uh, is the copyright warning uh, directed at? And what is the genesis of that, uh, of, of that warning? 
Uh, <clears throat> to answer that question, we really need to go back into the 1920s and 1930s when radio first came on the scene. Uh, and shortly after it did, uh, many of the uh, sports organizations uh, began to license the rights uh, to, tele uh, to, to uh, broadcast the games on, on, on radio. Uh, but there were many other broadcast stations who felt very strongly that what transpired in the course of a game was news uh, and that they had the right to broadcast the news. So through various means, uh, they would uh, uh, see what was happening in a game. They might have somebody uh, positioned in the stands of the game. Uh, in some cases, they might be in buildings outside the stadium looking at the game, or they might be listening to uh, authorized, uh, licensed broadcast of the game. And they would relay the accounts and descriptions of those games back to the unlicensed radio station uh, who would uh, then broadcast it uh, to its uh, audience. Uh, probably the leading case was uh, Pittsburgh Athletic uh, versus uh, KQV Broadcasting, uh, which involved an instance where uh, a station KQV uh, used people stationed on buildings around Forbes Field uh, in order to pick up, uh, to, to relay the accounts and descriptions uh, of the Pittsburgh Pirates games. And the court uh, actually enjoined KQV in that case, uh, saying that by reasons of the creation uh, of the game, uh, its control of the park and its restriction of the dissemination uh, news therefrom, the sports club, in the case the Pirates, has a property right in such news and the right to control the use thereof for a reasonable time following uh, the game. Uh, there were a number of other cases uh, that, uh, a number of other uh, uh, lawsuits filed uh, around the same time in the 30s and the 40s going into the 50s uh, where courts uh, reached uh, much the same conclusion. In a couple of cases, the courts uh, uh, had, a, had a contrary view. Uh, the litigation theories really centered around such things as unfair competition, interference with contract, unjust enrichment, fraud on the public, even uh, Communications Act uh, uh, violations. <clears throat> the notion of a property right concept got strengthened by the Supreme Court in, in, the, in the, the flying zucchini case. Uh, as uh, uh, some of you will recall, Mr. Zucchini, uh, the human cannonball, uh, objected to a local television station filming his act claiming that it was a violation of his right of publicity. Uh, the uh, station said, no, we have a First Amendment right uh, to be able to uh, film those, uh, those telecasts, and the Supreme Court disagreed. And in doing that, it cited favorably the uh, Pittsburgh athletic case, saying that clearly nobody has a right to go out and televise a baseball game, and the First Amendment doesn't give you that, uh, that particular right. The courts didn't really deal with copyright in these cases, didn't really deal with even common law copyright. There's really no mention of our common law copyright uh, in these cases. Uh, the notion of, of copyright really didn't come into, um, uh, in so far as it applied to sports broadcasting, uh, really didn't uh, emerge to the forefront until cable television came along in the 50s and the 60s. And cable had the ability to take telecasts uh, from one market and bring them into another market where the sports leagues or the clubs might have licensed exclusive rights. And so the commissioners of, uh, the, uh, of baseball, the N NBA, uh, the NFL, the NHL, the NCAA, uh, all urged Congress during the debates on the 1976 Copyright Act to make clear for the first time that there is a copyright in live sports telecasts so that they as copyright owners would be able to control the dissemination of those telecasts. Well, the, the sports organizations uh, sort of um, uh, won the battle but uh, lost uh, the, uh, the war in that uh, particular case. Uh, they uh, got a ruling uh, <clears throat> from the, uh, or at least language in the House report accompanying the 76 Act, which makes clear uh, that uh, the uh, telecast of uh, sports events are protected by copyright law, assuming that they are, uh, that they are recorded or fixed in a tangible medium of expression. However, uh, Congress accorded a compulsory license to, uh, to cable. 
uh, that uh, destroyed the right of the sports leagues, indeed all copyright owners, to control the telecast of that game. So um, who owns the copyright in the telecast? Well, shortly after the act went into effect, the broadcasters claimed that they are the owners uh, of the copyright uh, in telecast. And they pointed back to the language in the House report, which talked about the creative elements that broadcasters supply and the choice of, of different um, uh, camera angles and, and uh, what actually goes out on, 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 the, on the screen. Uh, and these arguments were all made in the context of uh, litigation involving distribution of the cable compulsory licensing royalties. Uh, the <clears throat> issue was debated back and forth between the then copyright royalty tribunal and uh, the DC circuit and it finally ended with kind of a negotiated resolution in which sports clubs would receive uh, all of the, uh, the royalties. Uh, but the question of really who owns the copyright um, became more academic going forward because virtually every contract that uh, is, is, um, is negotiated these days specifically provides for the sports club uh, as the copyright uh, uh, owner. And the broadcasters weren't the only ones uh, to argue that they own the rights in sports telecast. Uh, in the mid-80s, the Major League Baseball Players Association uh, claimed that, well, no one could televise a game without the consent of the, uh, copy, uh, without the, consent of, of the athletes uh, the, themselves, that is, the ball players. Uh, that claim was ultimately rejected uh, in the uh, uh, Baltimore Orioles uh, uh, case. Uh, where the court held that, well, copyright law had actually uh, preempted any kinds of rights of publicity that the athletes might have. Um, preemption, while it kind of saved the, the day for the clubs and uh, sports organizations uh, in, in, uh, in that case, uh, turned out not to be quite as friendly a doctrine uh, in the uh, NBA versus Motorola case, uh, where the court held that uh, uh, any kinds of, in that case involved uh, a device that Motorola had manufactured that gave fans a update, kind of a running live uh, update of, 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 of NBA games and other games um, that were in progress. And the court held that that did not constitute uh, copyright infringement. Uh, and it also rejected any kind of claims of misappropriation saying that they had been preempted uh, by, the, uh, uh, by, by the copyright act term. The, so what types of things uh, have the, the sports leagues litigated over? Well, uh, they've argued that the copyright laws do not allow, in that first case, ESPN uh, to uh, use highlights of their games without uh, consent. Uh, they've uh, argued uh, that uh, commercial establishments, i.e. sports bars, uh, cannot intercept uh, satellite to transmissions, unencrypted satellite transmissions of, of, of games. Um, They've uh, also argued uh, successfully that uh, satellite carriers, even though they had a compulsory license to retransmit programming uh, here in the United States, could not retransmit it uh, over to Canada. Uh, one loss was the Eastern Microwave a case, which involved the New York Mets. Uh, and uh, in that particular case, the court held that the passive carrier exemption uh, allowed Eastern Microwave to retransmit telecasts uh, of the Mets to uh, cable systems uh, here. Uh, <clears throat> just sort of uh, to kind of wrap it up uh, here I mean, the, the, uh, and bring it to the modern day uh, issues, um, they basically center around uh, internet um, uh, uh, issues, as is the case with most uh, copyright owners. Uh, the NFL, the MLB, Major League Baseball were all actively involved. Uh, in a number of the original streaming cases where internet services uh, wanted to stream broadcast signals uh, over the internet, either claiming that it did not implicate copyright law or if it did, that they had a compulsory license. Uh, in those cases, uh, the uh, clubs like the uh, sports leagues uh, were um, uh, successful in, in, in getting a ruling uh, that, um, that the um, uh, internet services uh, were violating the, uh, the Copyright Act. Um, the only other thing I'll, I'll add here at this point is, is that, uh, again, like all other sports, uh, like all other copyright owners, 
uh, sports organizations are very concerned with uh, uh, ongoing internet piracy, and, and they, like others, uh, have big teams of, 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 um, of people who are constantly sending out the DMCA notices. Uh, and that whole process has, has shown how the DMCA really uh, was not something that ever contemplated live sports uh, uh, telecast. Uh, because it contemplates this elaborate uh, system of notice and counter notice and all that. Uh, if you're a sports league, what you want is that program taken down immediately. So with that, I'll turn it back over to um, Whitney and uh, move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. So here we can see Bob's, we're coming full circle. All right, so Bob has given us the scene for uh, copyright matters surrounding broadcasts that come into our home. Now let's turn to individual fans. Um, as mentioned before, many of the songs and chants that allow fans to uh, connect to each other and support the team, like we have here, YMCA, awesome. Um, this, these are protected by copyright, right? So how is it that we get to perform and enjoy these songs in sporting context? Well, stadiums, bars, and venues, uh, they enter into agreements with performing rights organizations, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, um, so that everyone can cheer worry-free. And then there are also some exceptions and limitations that allow people to sometimes cheer um, and perform songs without permission of the copyright owner. So I'm sure many of the people in the audience uh, own pieces of sports memorabilia that may have some copyright protected elements to them. Um, when you own a, sports, a piece of sports memorabilia, uh, know that you have the ownership and control over the physical object, but the copyright, and if there is any in the object that you own, the copyright's owned by somebody else, right? And when you are the author of a sports-related work, say you take a video um, at a local soccer game, um, you create fan art, um, you have a written recap of the playoff game, um, you are also the owner in your creative expression because you've created that work. Now, you might even encounter copyright during your own athletic pursuits. If you've ever participated in team sports, uh, if you've ever participated in a road race, a triathlon, or any sort of amateur uh, exercise, or full-out competitive nature uh, event, you have likely have some sort of copyright-protected work that commemorates um, your participation. Uh, perhaps you purchased a team photo or a professional photograph of you fist pumping over the finish line, um, or your families and friends uh, took pictures uh, mid-game or mid-course as they cheered you on. Know that these photos are protected by copyright, and they are owned by the photographer who took the picture, so the professional photographer or the family or friend member. And of course, there are trophies and medals, right? Um, many finisher medals, especially the elaborate ones, are protected by copyright. And some trophies, like the Ironman Triathlon Trophy by John F. Collins, is also protected by copyright. And professional athletes have to think about copyright, too. Endorsement deals, merchandise, memoirs, and more. Many of these things have copyright implications. So top athletes, for example, publish memoirs that provide insight and inspiration. So we have three examples here. We have Racing to the Finish, My Story by Dale Earnhardt Jr. We have A Life Well Played by Arnold Palmer. And we've got Pressure is a Privilege by Billie Jean King. Copyright provides a structure for publishing agreements, printing, and distribution of these works to the public. Copyright provides a a, uh, promotes a creation of new material, and this material is something that has potential historic in value as well as the cultural insight. And then think of all the other creative merchandise that's out there as well. You know, we have bobbleheads, we have commemorative videos, uh, we have video games that feature athletes. There is copyright in abundance all around us when we think about sports. 
to guide us through the use of sports videos beyond the initial broadcast and some relationships between athletes, copyright, and sports, I'm happy to welcome our next speaker, Derek Higgins. Derek Higgins is the founder and CEO of the Global Sports and Entertainment Business Academies which is a private education provider for those that are interested in pursuing careers in sports and entertainment industries. Previously, Professor Higgins was the managing director of the Wharton School Business Initiative, or excuse me, the Wharton Sports Business Initiative at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He was also the general manager of AOL's Sports Channel, and he served in various roles at the National Football League. He's been named by the Sports Business Journal, multiple different honors, uh, the 20 most influential in sports and digital media, and he was on the 40 under 40 list in 2009. Today he will talk to us sort of about the afterlife of a broadcast, what happens to footage that's generated by professional sports leagues, and how are, what, what are the many ways in which this footage is used, monetized, and then passed on to future generations of fans. He'll also highlight some of the complications that occasionally result. So please help me welcome Professor Haggins. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you, Katie. Thank you to the Copyright Office for providing this forum for all of us today and for inviting me to come to, to speak. For, for those of us who have worked behind the scenes, in sports and entertainment uh, business and, and law for so many years. This is uh, one of those boring things that most people do not follow and associate with. So for us to have the opportunity to share with you the secret sauce uh, that, that brings to fans uh, around the world uh, the, uh, the content that, uh, that you consume uh, is really exciting. So uh, thank you again for, for putting this, uh, this, uh, this great event together. Um, also, thank you to Bob because Bob did a perfect, literally the perfect legal backdrop to so many things that, uh, that I'm going to speak to today. Um, I think the first question uh, for us to look at is what's the impact of, of copyright on the business of sports? And for us to, to think about that, we've got to take a step back. And, and, and Bob gave us a great legal history, but I'm going to give us a, uh, a little bit uh, sort of broader step back perspective on this. If we go back about 60 or so, so years before the 60s and the advent of television growing up into this global platform, um, from a revenue perspective, teams really made their revenue a few different ways. Ticket sales right, came up to, to the gate, um, food and beverage concessions, and, and advertising. That was primarily how, how they made their money. And then came along some really smart entrepreneurs. And let me ask the crowd here, how many folks have been to either a professional or college uh, sporting event? Okay, so I came to the right place, perfect, okay. So you've probably gone to an event and somewhere, either inside or outside the venue, you've seen some people selling merchandise. You may not necessarily know if they're affiliated with the team or the league, but you've seen them out, out selling. Well, so these smart people going back uh, in the day realize we've got all these fans here to see this contest, and they're fans of this particular team or teams, so maybe I can put together some merchandise and actually sell it to them and make some, make some money. And, the, and they did. And, and after a period of time, the team properties actually realized, hey, wait a second, there's a, there's a market here for us to expand our fan base and to give the fans what they want. They want more of, of us. And so these people are actually uh, taking advantage of our property, and they're cutting into our market of what we can actually make ourselves and put in our pockets. Fortunately, uh, in the 1940s, the Lanham Act uh, was, was passed uh, by President Truman that protected, protected trademark. So teams began to assert their, their, their trademark rights primarily, um, and we're talking about professional sports pri primarily, and controlling the use of the marks for those who were previously using them unauthorized. And again, today, we'll still go to sporting events and you'll see people outside. Now, uh, Bob will tell you, and, and from my time at the NFL, we've had uh, investigators and other groups that are out daily at different events and they're trying to, to cut down on this to make sure that people know what, how important it is that we, have, uh, that we protect uh, our marks. Uh, 
for football fans, for college football fans, you've probably heard of a guy by the name of Nick Saban. He's uh, widely regarded now as probably the best coach in the history of college football. Well, before there was Nick Saban, anybody heard of Bear Bryant in here? Any, any old school? Okay. There was this guy by the name of Paul Bear Bryant, and he used to wear this houndstooth hat. And he was known for walking the sidelines with a hat. And any time you saw him with that hat, you knew uh, that, was, that was Bear, Bear Bryant. So in the 70s, as coaches has become legendary, uh, a number of people came to him and said, hey, coach, I want to create some, some items with your, with your likeness and with you with the hat, and we can, we can make you some money. And so coach went to one of his former players by the name of Bill Battle, who actually now is the AD at Alabama. And he said, Bill, you're a business guy. I have no idea what these people want, but they want to do something with me. Can you, can you help me out? So Bill said, let me take a look at it. Helped him with, with some of his early deals, again, at, at the University of Alabama. Then Bill went to the university and said, hey, um, these people are selling all this Al Alabama merchandise, cups and hats and t-shirts and, and all types of things. Uh, you guys have no control over this. Maybe I can help you, the university. I'm already helping coach. And the school said, yeah, sure, you can do that. And then a lightning bulb went off, and, and Bill realized, I've got about two or 300 other universities that I can do this for in college and establish something called the Collegiate Licensing Company that exists, that exists today. Now, raise your hand if you have in your home a DVR. Sorry, it's just about everybody, right? But that wasn't the case just a short period of time ago. I remember actually in 2001, I was working at the National Football League, and because we had to deal with NFL Sunday ticket, um, I had access to the first ever TiVo, that people know the term, the term TiVo. And I had a bunch of friends at my house to watch a, a boxing match. It wasn't Mike Tyson, but let's, let's say it was Mike Tyson for the purposes of this, con this conversation. And, and Tyson knocks out his opponent, and everybody, wow, my goodness, okay, what a, what a great knockout. Well, I've got the remote control, and I press it, and I rewind the knockout. And larger than the response when there was a knockout, everybody jumped back, whoa, this is amazing. Is this magic? What, what, what is this? I said, yeah, I can, I can rewind television. <laughs> well, they, they had never seen it before. And I very coolly said, in about 10, 15 years, everybody will have this. And they thought I was crazy. So we have these seminal moments that where technology is able to take content to the next level. It was the same thing if we go back to the 40s. And Bob talked about the broadcast from, I think it was 39, was it, in, uh, in, in, in baseball. Well, back in the 40s, the big sports were boxing, horse racing, and baseball. Those are the three majors, right? So our biggest, our biggest uh, uh, person out there was, was, was Joe Lewis. Well, imagine, I'm used to listening to my baseball games on the radio, listening to my uh, broadcasts of, of boxing on the radio, and I invite some friends over to my house to take in the, the Lewis Schmeling Max or, uh, or Rocky, Rocky Marciano uh, match. And they come over, and say, well, are we gonna turn on the radio? I said, no, I've got this new thing. It's called a television. And everybody sits there, and they take in these visual images of something they've never seen before, live watching images of their favorite event. This helped to really grow the, uh, the uh, television adoption globally. Uh, I don't have time, I'll get into soap operas as well. But um, so how does that bring us to, to copyright in, in sports as we look at it today? Anybody heard of NFL films? Any NFL fans here? So, you know, some time ago there was this uh, kooky old guy named, named Ed Sable. And he was uh, living in suburban Philadelphia. He just loved to film everything. He loved to film sports, and so he, lo and he loved his, his Eagles. So he would film a lot of the Eagles. He would film other, other football. And once the NFL got a sense as to what he was doing, um, they would occasionally call him and say, hey, can you shoot this game or can you shoot this thing? Um, not knowing anything, what they would use it for, but, but they would have him do that. Well, 
nobody really thought about the rights around what he was doing. Fast forward, 1995, a gentleman by the name of Brian Bedall starts a, a network called Classic Sports. He says, what I'm gonna do is, a lot of people are really interested in old games. When I talk to my friends, what if we put together a network that actually had these old games and put that on? What well, was so popular when they put it on, two years later, ESPN bought it. It's now known as ESPN Classic. But it was one of the early sort of mass periods where people thought about how do we repurpose and reuse this, this content that was, that was shot. See, originally, the sports leagues and the teams really wanted to get more fans to consume their content. So if you're not here in the stadium, well, and you're, you, get, you got the radio broadcast, but now, okay, we can show television all over the place. And so we got more fans to take in our, our content, take in that actual game. But there was never really a thought of 50 years later, we would actually use the same content over and over and over again, and we could actually make, make money off of it. But now we're thinking, wow, now I can take, I can invest in creating one piece of content, and then I can chop it up and I can use it over and over and over and over again, whether or not for my purposes or whether it's, for, whether it's licensing, it, licensing it to, to someone else. This is a relatively new dynamic. Sometime about 10 years ago, um, I was in a room very similar to this with all the commissioners of, or the executive directors of all the college bowl games. And I had to explain to them, hey, just like you all license your trademarks to, to different sponsors for your bowls, what you all have been doing in the past is essentially giving away and selling the rights, your copyright, to your broadcast, to the, your broadcast partner, as opposed to maintaining that right yourself, giving them a limited license to broadcast it and use it for select purposes for a select part of time, but that you own it and you can relicense it as you choose for as, for as, for as long as you want. After that, we saw NBA TV uh, come to fruition. We saw NFL Network. Um, and then as we look at the professionals that I've talked about versus, versus college, if we look at the professional space, so every league, NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, on and on, each of them owns the copyright in any broadcast content that they create. That one single entity will own that copyright. Well, if we're, in, we're talking about college, I went to Duke, so I always gotta bring up Duke, okay? So, so if Duke plays uh, Georgetown, for example, in, in basketball, well, there's the preseason, so we got preseason NIT uh, tournament, we've got the regular season, and then we got the postseason, as we know, as the, the big March Madness. Well, if Duke plays Georgetown in the preseason in, uh, here in, in D.C. at the, well, now it's not the Verizon Center anymore, the uh, Cap, Cap One Center, well, who owns that copyright? Or if Duke plays Georgetown at Duke during the regular season, well, who owns the copyright to to that broadcast, or if they play them in the postseason during the NCAA tournament that's broadcast by Turner and CBS, well, who owns that, right? So we can have a variety of different answers for these two, two teams playing in, in those games. And that's just basketball. So that goes on to football and every other sport in college. So the rights are extremely fragmented um, in the in the collegiate spectrum, uh, going conference by conference by, by conference. So um, Whitney talked about um, images. It's the same thing. Uh, when I was at, at, the, at the NFL, if you go back 50 years, we think about some of the iconic images that, that we've seen, whether it's football, basketball, or otherwise, who owns, the, who owns the copyright? Before we started to assert copyright ownership at a certain period of time, well, who actually owned it? Was it the, the team? Was it the university? Is it the league? Is it the photographer? So if, if, we go to a, if you go to a game now 
anyone that's shooting on the, the sidelines or within the arena would have to sign something on behalf of their organization that says that while I'm shooting this particular contest, the rights to the copyright in these images are actually owned by, insert NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, and, and me or my company has a limited license to utilize that. But at the time that I was at the NFL, we had to survey probably hundreds of photographers who had shot images and, and some of, of their heirs that had photographic images going back to the, the teens uh, that we wanted to have access to and work out basically collecting a, a, a library. Um, so what does that mean for today? So we said 1960, where trademark and copyright were essentially not even a part of the revenue stream of professional sports. As so we look at these, these numbers, roughly $8 billion, and I think Bob mentioned, uh, I can't remember exactly what that total number was, about 20, 20 billion total for all uh, major sports properties. The NFL alone brings in eight billion. Eight billion with a B per year, which is about 75, 80% of their, their annual revenue. Juxtapose that to 1961, where their first agreement with CBS was $4.65 million. million. Um, so we see that what started as a very small slice of the pie is now a significant, the majority, the vast majority of the pie and, and growing. Uh, so as we wrap up, uh, finally we talk about, um, about athletes. Now athletes see themselves now as content creators and copyright owners. We see LeBron James with his show The Barbershop on HBO, Kevin Durant in the boardroom, Tom Brady on Facebook with Tom versus Time, creating and owning their own content so that they can not only control it, but they can bring in the money and decide how they're going to disseminate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. So now we are going to shift things up a little bit, and we'd like to get all of you involved. Um, so if you, have a if you have a cell phone or a mobile device, please take it out right now. We're going to test everybody's copyright trivia knowledge with sports. So here's some instructions. Uh, if you don't have cell phone service, uh, you're welcome to connect to the Wi-Fi LOC guest. I will give everybody a couple seconds to make sure that they're connected. Um, and for anybody who's watching at home, please know that you too can participate using your cell phone and mobile device. Um, what we're gonna do, what you wanna do is you want to use the number 22333 and text the phrase copyright M506. And then you'll hit send, and then hopefully you will get a confirmation that you are all set up. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Are we having some success? Not hearing not, okay. Um, so we'll start playing. Um, when you see the screen, you'll text your answer A, B, C, or D. And just keep in mind, only answer once. Here's our first question. Which famous college fight song is not yet in the public domain? Is it A, the Victory March by the Notre Dame for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, uh, Boomer Sooner for the Oklahoma Sooners, Yay Alabama for the Alabama Crimson Tide, or On Wisconsin by the, for the Wisconsin Badgers. Okay, so we'll close it out. And here's the correct answer. It is C. Uh, the fight song for the Alabama Crimson Tide is the one song that is still protected by uh, copyright. Congratulations, 20% of you. Good job. Here's our next question. Which type of work is eligible for copyright protection? Is it A, a snowboarding move, B, 
ballet choreography, C, a sequence of yoga poses, or D, a popular line dance? I think we have a lot of copyright people in the room. Um, so yes, B, ballet choreography. Choreography being one of the categories um, in, in, in copyright law. Um, and of course, popular line dances, we know social dances are not protected. Uh, sequence of yoga poses, snowboard, snowboarding moves. We've got sports moves. Okay, so we've got our third question. A fan takes a photo of a sporting event for their own personal use. Who owns the copyright? So the event venue, the home team, the athlete in the photo, or the fan who took the photo? Okay, so which is the correct answer? I heard D, yes, the fan who took the photo, yes. Um, so we think of authors, the people who fix the creative expression in a tangible, me tangible medium of expression. That's gonna be the owner in this situation. All right, so thank you for playing along, guys. So we've just connected now across space and time because I'm hoping that some of our webcasters uh, played along too. Um, it helps us to bring us to our final topic. Uh, we think of sports as requiring physical space. We think of a, 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 a field or a snow-covered mountain for a race or a race course. Um, new developments in sports really helps us and pushes us to consider sports in the virtual world. So in 1972, Atari Games released Pong, which was the first sports video game. Uh, Atari registered the owner's manual with the Copyright Office, actually. And over time, video games gained wide recognition as creative works that are protected by copyright. We recognize their visual displays and code as creative expression. And the Copyright Office receives many applications each year for video games. Since the release of Pong, we've seen a lot of sports-related video games that have become popular and a center of the video game industry. Here are just a few, Madden, Madden NFL, NBA 2K, or Mario Tennis. And of course now competition is not just isolated to sports-based video games. We have seen a rise in multiplayer video games such as League of Legends, Call of Duty, Overwatch, StarCraft, and Fortnite that invite gamers to collaborate and compete in rich, expressive environments. So in little over a decade, what we've seen with these multiplayer games is a more formal competitive scene that's developed. Uh, in this scene, we have top gamers that vie for lucrative prize money to international audiences. We've got a world of esports now, and this world of esports relies on copyright protected materials. And this world is growing rapidly, right, with more and more people that are watching esports events. Uh, competitions, they come to viewers' homes through different services, uh, such as Twitch. Um, and with this, some people are predicting that by 2020, viewers might be watching about 3 billion hours of esports, uh, accounting for about 10% of all sports viewing. And there's even some predictions that by 2021, more people will watch esports than any other professional sports league other than the NFL. So audiences even will show up for stadium events, right? So last year, the League of Legends Worlds, which was in Incheon, in Incheon, South Korea, uh, it was held in a stadium that could hold over 50,000 fans. In short, esports is a whole new ball game. And to explain how copyright and esports works together, we have our final speaker, Del uh, Delara Derekshani, and she will tell us more about this growing industry. Uh, Delara is the Tech Policy Council for the Entertainment Software Association. She represents publishers of computer and video games. Prior to serving at the ESA, she was Policy Council at Consumer Reports, where she advocated before Congress, the administration, and federal agencies on telecom and privacy issues. 
She's been featured on several media channels, such as NBA, NBC, Nightly News, All Things Considered, NBC4 Washington, HuffPost Live, and Marketplace. So without further ado, Delara. Thank you all so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, my goal for today is to give you all a better uh, idea of the scope and size of eSports, as well as some of the varied stakeholders and the players in this space, because I think it has some really interesting implications for copyright. Um, so since today is all about sports, uh, I'd also like to highlight some of the interesting ways that traditional sports and esports are melding, um, interacting, and partnering. Before I do that, how many people in the room have ever heard of the term esports? And I'm asking this, but I really can't see anybody. Okay, so that's a fair amount. Um, often when I present on esports, depending on the audience, um, I'll get a few chuckles when I explain that esports is competitive video gaming. Um, the fact of the matter is that we are seeing phenomenal growth in this space, uh, and its legitimacy is unquestionable. Um, we have entire stadiums being sold out for events, as was just alluded to. Uh, you have new stadiums being uh, built for the sole purpose of esports. Uh, we have cities competing to become the next U.S. hub of esports. Um, we, uh, we're seeing a fan base not too dissimilar from that of traditional sports, um, with loyalty to particular teams, loyalty to particular players, um, and to individual video games. Uh, in terms of traditional media, we're seeing major, some of the most major networks um, and uh, you know, broadcast esports tournaments. Uh, and we also have streaming services, as mentioned a few minutes ago, um, dedicating, dedicated to streaming esports. We're also seeing an incredible amount of non-endemic companies pouring money into this space. Um, what I mean by non-endemic is, is um, companies outside of the traditional video game space. Um, everyone from Pepsi to Coca-Cola to Geico to Comcast, you name it, has recognized um, just what a unique and uh, up-and-coming space this is. So a little more about the interaction between traditional sports and esports. Um, we are seeing the owners of traditional teams either invest in or buy esports teams. Uh, the NBA recently ventured into esports. Uh, they have a joint venture with uh, called the NBA 2K League um, with um, the publisher uh, Take Two Interactive. And this is really interesting um, because their first season was in uh, 2018 and involved a full-blown full draft for esports players at Madison Square Garden. Um, and we have 17 esports teams, and each one of them uh, has a, a partnership with a real-life NBA team. So that's a really unique, uh, a really unique uh, partnership. Which brings me to an interesting point, which is that uh, companies in this space have varied business models when it comes to esports. Uh, a lot of publishers are taking a more active role in the production and the governing of the competitive and the tournament aspect of esports, uh, which helps them ensure quality and stability and, um, you know, has a lot to do with promoting the brand. It's, it's important to be involved. Um, and others have taken a hands-off approach. Um, so now on to the copyright issues in esports and video games specifically. In some respects, copyright issues are similar in esports uh, to the copyright issues in traditional sports. In other respects, esports present issues distinct from traditional sports. Uh, one important difference is that in esports, the underlying video game itself is uh, subject to copyright owned by the, the game publishers. Of course, this gives rise, as we all know, this gives rise to an exclusive set of rights and permits the copyright holder, the game publisher, to prevent others from infringing those rights. 
Uh, it also gives game publishers discretion to, uh, over what rights to license. Um, and I think this is really interesting because as, as I was listening to the other two presenters, it sort of made me realize just how many parallels there are between these uh, spaces. Uh, I think the most interesting set of, uh, the most interesting right is the right of public performance, um, which raises a question, a novel question, about whether third parties who conduct uh, or or conduct live tournaments, or broadcast or stream live tournaments, uh, if um, if this requires the permission of the holder of the copyright, and I would argue that it does. <laughs> um, when it comes to IP enforcement issues within the esports sector, um, the enforcement issues are not dissimilar to those that we see in the traditional sports realm either. Um, first, you have unauthorized. Uh, and counterfeit, counterfeit merchandise sales um, distributed both via physical and online platforms. And so ESA members and eSport team owners use traditional means of enforcement, including DMCA takedowns. Uh, we also work really closely with online platforms uh, who, who've done a great job of providing tools in this space um, and rolling out technology to assist. A second enforcement issue that has also come up is uh, the issue of unauthorized broadcasts of esports matches. And finally, there's the issue of cheating. Now, this cheating issue isn't solely under the purview of IP, and it's not solely seen um, from the IP context, but I think it's worth mentioning, uh, as it's one of the largest issues that we're facing in the industry right now. To give you a brief idea of what this is, uh, there exists cheating software that uses code to directly uh, alter source code of games. Uh, so now, not only does this make for an, author an unauthorized derivative work, but it also generally tends to tilt the scales uh, in favor of one player or another. Um, and I think one important thing to note is that ensuring a fair and balanced play um, in esports tournament is incredibly important and a priority of, um, of video game companies. So I think a lot of incredible growth in esports can be attributed to the advent of new technologies, uh, the development of streaming platforms, um, the expansion of broadband that makes it possible for folks to stream uh, games from home or broadcasts of games from home. Um, and so there are a lot of interesting ways that esports uh, e are engaging with audiences and, and working to attract new audiences. Um, we're still trying to figure out how to deal with a lot of these uh, issues, uh, emerging issues. But I think a good takeaway is that um, to remember that, that it's just as important in this industry as it is in many of the others, which with we're fam you all are familiar, um, to encourage the growth uh, and innovation in this space, it's important to have um, strong copyright and strong enforcement protections in place. Um, there are many other interesting issues that, that have come up and that I'm only just going to touch on briefly, but that includes um, to what extent does, does, um, does a, an original broadcast uh, need to be changed in order for it to be um, considered fair use, for example. Um, there are a lot of interesting ways that technology is being used to attract new audiences, I mentioned, and this could include overlays uh, with, with, um, with new commentary or statistics on the screen, and there are a lot of interesting questions about just how much a works need to be changed in order to be considered transformative. Um, but with that, I will just say that uh, I look forward to any questions that you all may have. And thank you very much again for having me. And happy World IP Day. <laughs>
All right, and I'll also I'll invite our speakers on stage. And so we are going to have some mic runners on either side of the aisle. So you'll see four of them. We've got some wonderful copyright office employees and some wonderful copyright employees as chair experts, too. So if you have a question, please feel free to flag down one of our microphone holders uh, so that everybody can hear the question. Um, while we're getting set up, oh, we've got one back there. Hello, my name is Dana Shear. I work for Congressional Research Service. I have a question for Bob. Um, what do you think would happen if the Satellite Television Extension and Localism Act, uh, or I should say the compulsory licenses were not um, reauthorized, what would happen to a superstation like WPIX? Would they be able to negotiate um, the station, the super stations that are carrying uh, baseball games? Well, I, I think, as you know, uh, sports leagues have never been fans of the, uh, of the compulsory licenses. They've always felt that, uh, that uh, they would rather negotiate in the marketplace uh, with those uh, who uh, want to use their rights. Uh, you know, my, my view of it is, is that uh, if the compulsory license uh, uh, doesn't exist, um, that, that product is still going to get out there. If there is demand for that product, others will uh, find a way to, uh, uh, to put it out there. Uh, but putting that aside, I mean, you know, as I said in my, my earlier remarks, uh, right now virtually every game uh, that is played. Every telecast of every certainly of ba Major League Baseball games and probably of the other sports is out there and available uh, for those uh, who want it. And that's wholly independent of any type of, of compulsory license. Hi, this is for Delara or Derek, since you did mention, uh, you know, like LeBron James creating his own content, but in the um, world of NBA 2K or NBA, I forget what it's called. Um, the issue with the, uh, with the tattoo copyright um, on the players when they're recreating it for the game, like who owns that? Is it the publishers that are creating the games that are then having to create the likeness of the player with the tattoos on it? Or is it the player who has the tattoo on it? Or is it the tattoo artist? I remember that being brought up and I forget which player had a supreme uh, tattoo logo on him, and that was a huge issue when it came down to recreating his likeness on NBA 2K. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I completely understand the question in terms of the, the use regarding the tattoo. If I recall the situation with, with Supreme, and I can't remember exactly what player, the issue was uh, the, the, the right to use a Supreme, right, which was actually a, uh, it was a mark that's owned by a third party company. And so how would that necessarily be, be treated? Now, the issue with uh, the players sort of having that in use of, uh, of, a, of a, the game contest, right, in, in, in 2K, is, is the NBA or the copyright owner authorized to use this third party mark in, the, in their commercial use? Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to, can you all hear me? Um, I'm trying to work, recall the way that that ended up, and I'm happy to follow up with you offline. Um, uh, but I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. What yeah, because I, I, I think there were a couple of issues that that were that were in it. So, uh, with respect to what are the, the players' sort of right. rights, and then as the copyright owner, what's the NBA's right to use a essentially they could be uh, seen as a sponsor, right? And so like any other third party commercial property seen within a broadcast does, uh, you know, who has the right to actually use that. And I don't believe at that time there was communication between the NBA's copyright owner and, and Supreme. Thank you. Hi, uh, Kirk Klaus, this is for Derek. Um, you mentioned that uh, in the particular context of basketball contests, photographers enter into venues and they sign off, basically grant out their rights for still photography. Um, how does that work? Presumably these people aren't work for hire, so how does that, would that work under a recapture right 35 years from now? 
Uh, presumably, again, the photographer should be able to recapture those grants unless it's a work for hire. Could you, could you help me out and give me a time frame for what you're talking about? So um, 35 you're, years in the past, when are we talking about that, that an image may have been captured? Are we talking about current day? Or are we talking about 50 years ago? Help me out a little bit. Let's just say since 76, since the 76 Copyright Act. And you had mentioned that photographers, still photographers entering into basketball venues and presumably other sporting venues um, sign off their rights to third parties. So it would seem that the clock is ticking relative to the, those grants that they should be able to recapture those rights after a certain period of time. Yeah, so uh, let's, if, we, if we're making the assumption that the, that the photographer, uh, where they're not operating independently as, as their self or on behalf of some third party news, news source, whether it's uh, ESPN, CBS, Sports Illustrated, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, signs off on a license before they are provided their media credential to come in and shoot. And such license provides them the opportunity only to come in and shoot that contest and any images acknowledging that that property, whether or not it's the college property, we're talking about the NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, otherwise, that that property has ownership rights, full ownership rights in that content, but they can use it for the purposes that they were prescribed to come in and shoot for those news purposes, but not for other commercial use, they'd have the right to utilize it. I guess my question is then they wouldn't be considered the author of the work if, if that's the case, if they couldn't recapture those rights. They could be considered an author, essentially under work for hire, yes, essentially. Um, there's a question in the back corner. Um, my question is specific to esports. Um, I know a lot of players often broadcast sometime on YouTube. So do the players own that copyright or is there some type of licensing agreement between them and YouTube? So a lot of these issues do come down to licensing agreements. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I work for a trade association, and so obviously each company sort of has their agreements with others um, that I'm not it's privy to all of them. But um, I, I, I believe that, um, that uh, there is, in generally in built into the licenses um, provisions that would would address those issues. And actually, Delora, if I might ask, um, you know, with gamers being able to share their their gameplay much easier now, would you have like any general advice? Yeah, sure. Um, I think my advice would be to um, to consult with uh, resources online that companies have made available. Um, a lot of companies have their own guidelines um, for users and platforms um, when it comes to uploading and live streaming. Um, and so I think it's important to be cognizant of, of what those particular rules are. Thank you. OK, we've got a question in the back row in the center. Yes, uh, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. I worked for Bear Bryant when I was a student at the University of Alabama. I've edited books for Nick Saban. I wanted to talk to the gentleman from, is it Arlen and Porter? Yes. Uh, I'm a book editor, and four weeks ago tomorrow, uh, a judge in Houston, Texas, uh, in a copyright infringement case against Texas A&M University, which I filed five years ago for copyright infringement. They loved a book of mine so much, they stole it, they gave it away to 400,000 people, and four weeks ago, a judge said they can get off scot-free because they're claiming copyright, I mean, they're claiming sovereign immunity. I don't understand how a state university can get away claiming sovereign immunity for clearly we have an email from them where they said they actually retyped this 
and then send it out by email to 400,000 of their people. I don't understand how a university can make hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, yet claim sovereign immunity and not have to pay for what they stole. I, how, does the, how does that square? Now, Bob, before you answer, would you consider this initial consultation, or do we need to quote your <laughs> fees? I just want to make sure that you're well taken care of. I, well, thank you. Thank you, Derek. You're always looking out for me, I know. Um, I, I was, I was going to say, you, you should really get yourself a good lawyer. <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't put myself as an expert uh, in that, uh, uh, that area. I suppose they're relying upon the 11th Amendment, uh, which uh, gives them subclaims of sovereign immunity. Uh, my only other advice is, is that uh, you should appeal. Well, I'm sorry we didn't meet each other earlier. <laughs> Bad timing. All right, so we have a, a question in the middle. The gentleman in the, in, with the plaid. Uh, I'm Bill Dunlop from Eurovision. So I have another question about players. Um, one of the key moments you identified was when the Sports Federation stopped ceding their copyright to broadcasters and instead uh, give them a limited license. And this, of course, resulted in a huge increase in the revenue to the Sports Federations. But what's the position of the individual players whose performance is actually generating the money? Do they have any claim to a share? Uh, of this extra revenue, or is our players' compensation just a matter of a private contract between them and the team? So, uh, when when every player enters, assuming I'm, I'm taking this question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm uh, done giving free <laughs> legal advice here. When uh, for for every player within uh, any of the the team sports professional team sports uh, signs a contract. There are certain provisions in that contract that speak to the use of their image uh, during their, their playing periods uh, in, in and around actual contests. Um, the rights around the use of player image in and around contests is something that's collectively bargained between the Players Association and the league. So that individual player uh, does not have any control over that when they initially come into a particular league, but that is something that has been left to those that handle the bargaining on behalf of the Players Association, representing all of the players, uh, all the current players. Uh, again, there, there are a number of, of uh, young people that we'll see uh, tonight going in the first round of the NFL draft that once they become members, of, of the NFL, they'll say, hey, wait a second, you know, you guys have already given away, you know, our rights. Well, the, the current players aren't necessarily focused on the college players, they're focused on themselves. Um, and so the revenue that is produced for that game, so when I say that, that, uh, that $8 billion in, in, in revenue is part of uh, the overall pie, which is called different things in, in, in different leagues, it's basketball related income, BRI, and and basketball and other, other terms in, in football and baseball, but a percentage of that overall revenue goes specifically to the players and has to be distributed by each team in team contracts to those players. So all the revenue that is derived goes specifically to the teams and distributed specifically to player contracts. Well, so outside of the, they do not in their performance. Uh, the, the league owns the, the rights in, in their performance. Um, outside of that, there can be uh, a, additional, additional claims, but within the, the scope of the actual performance, that's all owned by the league. Yeah, let me just add, I mean, the, the question you raise is, is essentially the one that uh, was litigated over in the Baltimore Orioles case that I mentioned back in the 1980s. You know, there it wasn't clear that the players really had uh, any kind of entitlement as a result of the collective bargaining uh, agreement. And so, but their argument was that, no, they had a right of publicity, not a copyright, but a right of publicity uh, that uh, meant that no one could take the broadcasts of their performances and use them without their consent. 
And the court rejected that claim, saying essentially that uh, the copyright law had preempted uh, any type of right of publicity. Now, that issue of right of publicity that athletes have uh, and the extent of copyright uh, preemption uh, has not been totally resolved by the Baltimore Orioles case. There are still cases that are pending, particularly in the college arena, uh, that uh, raise the basic question of, uh, do the players have a right of publicity here that would get them where I think you know, you're suggesting they should be able to go? Um, but you know, Derek says, these matters are usually resolved uh, as a result of collective bargaining agreements or other types of, of, of agreements. That's why it hasn't been an issue in baseball uh, since the 1980s uh, and the Orioles case was decided. It's something that, like so many other issues in, in copyright, it, it just basically decides you know, who has the burden to get what they want from the other side. You know, who has the right to begin with? And how do you um, uh, monetize that? But um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at it as a pure academic uh, a question of, of copyright and preemption law, and that's what was addressed in the Baltimore Orioles case. But in, in addition to what, what you're saying, Bob, and going back to the original question, outside of actual games, there's a big issue around right of publicity with a lot of players and, and former players. If you've ever seen sort of the best of this or best of that or history of the Super Bowl or, or these different things and how they promote it, uh, the different sports can have issues with players or former players based on that. So, so if you had uh, best of uh, the Chicago Bulls and you were promoting it with this big image of, of Michael Jordan with smaller images of Scottie Pippen and, and Dennis Rodman, for example, uh, the NBA might say, well, we're just promoting you know, the, you know, the, the best of the Chicago Bulls. But Michael Jordan might separately say, oh, no, no based on how you're promoting this particular product, and look at my image, you guys are promoting, you know, you're selling me, right? And so my right of publicity sticks out outside of this, this overall use, which leagues generally put in in the CBA in, in terms of right of publicity, not only can we use your image for, for game content, et cetera, but we can use it for the promotion of the general interest of professional basketball, baseball, football. And the question is, if you're promoting these types of products, is it, is it promotion of the sport or is it a commercial venture for the league? All right, thank you. So I would like to thank our speakers one more time. Uh, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Derek. Thank you so much, Delara, for offering your expertise today. I'd like to thank our staff at the Copyright Office and the Library of Congress for putting on a great Copyright Matters. And I'd like to thank our audience here in the Coolidge Auditorium and at home uh, on our web streaming. Um, we did hand out a survey. If you'd like to complete that and let us know your thoughts of today, we would love that. And if you'd like to join us, uh, we are continuing the uh, Copyright Matters uh, World IP Day celebration on Saturday with a special uh, reader's uh, story time at the Young Readers Center at the Library of Congress. Uh, this is great for families. Uh, with children from five to 10. And then in July, we will have our next Copyright Matters, which will focus on adventure. So thank you so much again, um, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>